Sephardic traditional literature to modern Serbian and Yugoslav literature. And because it covers so much time, I have to go through certain um, segments very quickly. Basically, what my starting point is the Ottoman period, pre-modern society, Sephardic literature mainly divided into the written tradition in Hebrew with religious topics dominant, and on the other hand, Sephardic oral tradition in Judeo-Spanish, in other words, folklore. And what I will be talking about is the post-Ottoman period, where we have the beginning of several periods of change, important changes. First of all, in the post-Ottoman period, we have the transition from a pre-modern to a modern society. And what we have is the effort uh, to forge a modern secular written literature. And in this period, we also have in the 19th century, we have new things happening like printing presses, newspapers, we have uh, changes in education, women accessing education, a change in the status of women, and all these elements um, which are historical, sociological, even political, had a very important impact on how the attitude towards literature changed. And I will be limiting myself to Yugoslavia, but actually talking <coughs> a little bit about the pre-Yugoslav period, and later the first Yugoslavia, second Yugoslavia, and post-Yugoslavia. As far as the big change that happened in the 19th century, there are two models of transition in this area of the Balkans. One identified with Serbia, the other one with Bosnia. There are certain important differences. In Serbia, the beginning of the 19th century, we have several insurrections, liberation of, the, of Serbia to some extent, in 1830, we have autonomy of Serbia. And why is this important? Because in Serbia, the Jewish community, which was mostly Sephardic, but also there were Ashkenazis, uh, there was a change of size because the initial support of the Ottoman um, administration and rule changed into the support of the Serbian uh, efforts to liberate the country and modernize the new Serbian state. Why was this important? For example, in 1837, when the first state uh, press was established in Belgrade and Kragujevac, immediately, due to a very good relationship between the ruler of Serbia at that time, Miloš Obrenović, and the Sephardic community, and especially one family from that community, the family of the Davičos, David, later called Davičov. Due to this very good relationship, already in 1837, the state press had a section for the printing of books and periodicals in Hebrew and in Judeo-Spanish, which was very important for the modernization of um, culture, uh, Sephardic culture in uh, Serbia. And just to go on with this example of the press, there is also a, a process of integration of the Jewish community into the Serbian environment, social, economic, but also cultural. And this led to the linguistic assimilation, gradual linguistic assimilation of the Sephardim in Serbia. This press that began printing books in 1837 stopped printing books in Hebrew and Judeo-Spanish by the beginning of the 20th century. Why? Because most of the writers and the readers had already switched to the Serbian language. This language change was extremely important in literature, not only in literature, but especially in literature. We have, by the end of the 19th century, um, a man from the Sephardic community, Haim Davicho, who was the first Sephardic author in Serbia who began writing and publishing literary works in the Serbian language. <coughs> 
this was an important precedent because later on many other Sephardic writers will follow this example. Uh, Chaim David Cho wrote in the Serbian language, but most of his works deal with the Sephardic community of Belgrade, especially Belgrade, and everything he describes are either Jewish Sephardic characters or families or the community itself or the customs. So the content of his short stories uh, and his works is marked by, these, uh, Jew by Jewishness, the content. So what is interesting is that he tried to translate his view of Jewish cultural memory and cultural present into the Serbian language. And from this we have a new identity, which uh, I call a Jewish-Serbian identity, which was established by the beginning of the 20th century in Serbia. Now in Sarajevo, in Bosnia, things were different, because in Bosnia there was a multi-religious, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, environment in which uh, the Jewish Sephardic community was an element of this multicultural whole. And all of these elements uh, had divergent interests. And so uh, Bosnia remained a very orientalized, conservative environment until 1878, when the two provinces, Bosnia and Herzegovina, changed hands, so to say, in one day, from the Ottomans to Austria-Hungary. This was the crucial change in Bosnia, but it happened fairly late, 1878. So the, the changes that uh, happened in Bosnia regarding the Sefa theme and the literature and the culture began in the last two decades of the 19th century. Uh, now we come to 1918, and this is the establishment of Yugoslavia, a new country which consisted of some parts which had been under the Ottoman rule in previous periods and other regions which had been under Austria-Hungary. So it was, uh, again, a very multi-religious, multicultural new country and what's interesting is that the Jewish community of Yugoslavia consisted two-thirds Ashkenazi from the Austro-Hungarian previous uh, regions and one-third of Sephardic. So in this period between 1918 and 1945, we have the most interesting discussion on Jewish identity in this area of the Balkans. This is already Yugoslavia. So we have several options of how to approach culture and what, um, what goals to follow. We have, for example, integrationism, to integrate into the Yugoslav environment, to write in Serbo-Croatian the majority language and so on. Then we have, uh, at the beginning of the century, a very strong influence of Zionism, uh, not only as a political uh, ideology, but as a cultural ideology as well. And then in the 20s and 30s, we have a reaction of the Sephardic community, especially the Bosnian one. We have something called the Sephardic movement, which accepted Zionism as a political ideology, but did not want to renounce the cultural heritage of the Sephardim. And so uh, this was uh, termed as a sort of cultural separatism of the Sephardic, Sephardim in Yugoslavia, but especially strong in Bosnia. Then we had in Serbia already a Jewish-Serbian identity emerging. And because this new country was Yugoslavia, we also have efforts of forging a new Jewish-Yugoslav identity. So in the 20s and 30s, all of these options were in, on the table. And there were many discussions of what to do and how to proceed and so on. Uh, now 
why did I mention these two models? Because in that period, we have in Bosnia writers, Sephardic writers like Capon and Laura Papo Bocoret and others, who continue want to write in Judeo-Spanish to forge a modern secular literature in the Judeo-Spanish language. At the same time, another writer in Bosnia, whose name is Isak Samokovlia, chose another option, which was to write in Serbo-Croatian. In other words, uh, move out of the Judeo-Spanish linguistic ghetto. And so Samokovlia, as well as the other authors I mentioned, they all write about Jewish topics, Jewish themes, Jewish characters. One set of writers do it in Judeo-Spanish, and Samokovlia is doing it in Serbo-Croatian. While at the same time in Serbia, we have a slightly different situation because we have one writer, Jacques Confino, who is like a complementary to Isak Samokovlia. Isak Samokovlia is more, has a tragic perspective, while Jacques Confino has a more humorous or comic perspective. But at the beginning of the century, there is something very new happening in Serbia. And this is the literary avant-garde. We have two writers who had uh, a very important role in the development of the Serbian literary avant-garde. One of them was Moni Debuli, who was one of the, in Serbia, one of the first followers of Dadaism, and also later of Surrealism. He later moved to Paris and, and uh, participated directly in all of the activities of the French Surrealists. And another more important writer, whose name is Oscar Davicho, who also was a surrealist and who later moved into social literature. So we have this uh, movement. And he was also a well-known communist before World War II and continued being so after the war. So this is a kind of very important discontinuity and the poetics of the avant-garde is, by definition, discontinuity against tradition, breaking norms of tradition, and looking for something new. Uh, I would like now to read uh, one part of my presentation that has to do with Oscar Davicho. Now, I mentioned another Davicho, Haim Davicho. The two are related, not directly, but they are from the same family. And although an indirect descendant of Haim Davicho, who considered himself a Serb of the Mosaic faith, Oscar Davicho considered himself a Serb and an atheist where faith were literature and revolution. Those were the two priorities in his uh, poetics. For Davicho, revolution was the promise of freedom and social justice for all the poor and the humble, Jews, women, majorities, but also minorities. With Davicho, there is an obvious identification with the Serbian language, which he subjects to the force of his personal linguistic creativity. In Serbian literature, Oscar Davicho is one of the writers where linguistic creativity, in his poetry especially, is uh, very impressive. He twists and turns the language inside out, squeezes and expands it, breaks it, and puts it back together in new and unusual ways. In most of his works, there are no Jewish references, but there are two exceptions. The first one is his cycle of poems titled Hana, published in 1939. And it is important for two reasons as an outstanding poem in Serbian literature of the time, and as one of only two of Davicho's works in which the issue of Jewish identity is elaborated directly. There is a Jewish marker in the title, of course, the name of his beloved, Hana, and as um, observed by uh, other critics, there are references to Jewish literary sources in the description of the beauty of this young lady. But more importantly, another poem of the Hana cycle refers to the lyrical subject. We're dealing with poetry here. Uh, 
easily identified with the author, who projects a Jewish self-image while omitting the word Jew. He never mentions it. The ritual elaborates the connotations of the mental and emotional elements encoded in the identity of his ancestors. He begins with what they were not. They were not, quote, somebodies who retire at night fearlessly and rise in the morning cheerfully. They were, he writes, black nobodies, always thirsty, yearning for love, even from the bottom of the stakes and the top of the gallows, muffling their laughter, concealing their love, fleeing from the sun, withdrawing underground, away from every shadow. These are all quotes. And ending with uh, uh, the, the syntax, sadly missing every hope. In another poem, the Vitra presents identity through flesh, literally, and blood, metaphorically. I quote, in my flesh live my ancestors, kissing each other. If you bite me, my sad mother and all the sad saints will gush forth from the cut. Another poem approaches identity from another angle as it refers to a history of pogroms and expulsions that are also projected into the future, not only part of the past, but he anticipates them in the future. And uh, as observed by Alexander Petro, my husband, the poem massacres, it's part of the Hana cycle, reads as an anticipation of the Holocaust, a predecessor of post-war Holocaust poetry. The writers mentioned in this section are not all of the same stature. Today, most of them are more or less part of literary history, with the exception of Oscar Davicho, and I would like to mention only another very important Jewish writer, but of Ashkenazi background in Serbia, uh, Stanislav Inaver. Both of them remain as key writers in the 20th century Serbian literature. Now, post-war Yugoslavia, after the Holocaust. The second Yugoslav period, from 45 to 92, was crucially impacted by the Holocaust. Turbulent discussions on identity conducted in the previous period were cut short by the racist policies of the Ustasha government in the independent state of Croatia and the occupational forces of Axis countries, Germany, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Italy, that assumed control in the remaining parts of dismembered Yugoslavia. Over 81% of the Yugoslav Jewish population perished in the Holocaust. Roughly half of the survivors made Aliyah to Israel after 48. The other half that opted to remain in Yugoslavia sought to unite, integrate, and articulate a post-Holocaust Jewish Yugoslav identity. Jewish writers from this period, regardless of their Sephardic or Ashkenazi background, wrote in Serbo-Croatian, the majority language in Yugoslavia, integrating into the literatures of Yugoslavia. The Holocaust had practically erased any remaining differences between writers of Sephardic or Ashkenazi background. Among the new post-war Yugoslav Jewish writers were, just to mention a few, there were many, many more, just to mention a few, Erich Kosh, born 1913, Alexander Tishma in 1924, Danilo Kish, born in 1935, Philip David, born 1940. Pre-war writers such as Confino, Samokovlia, Vinaver, and Davicho continued writing after the war. Among uh, Davicho's post-war works, there is only one containing Jewish themes, characters, and references. And this is a novel called Master of Oblivion, published in 1986, just a few years before his death. The main character in this, characters in this long and tortuous novel, narrative, are mostly of Sephardic background and from Dorchol, which was the Jewish quarter in Belgrade before the war. <coughs> 
However, unlike his predecessor, Hein Loicho, who presented an idealized and sentimental version of Sephardic life in Belgrade, Oscar Davicho's novel displaces reality into the ambivalent realm of consciousness, memory, and fantasy, creating a negative utopia permeated with contradiction, irony, and parody. While the protagonists are anti-heroes, multiple narrators in this novel present different versions of events, moving the chronology back and forth, forth, pushing the story into various divergent directions. While fantasy is embedded in the texture of real, everyday experience, hyper-realistic descriptions dissolve reality in the unreal domain of memory, fantasy, and oblivion. And oblivion, wrote Davicho, has, quoting, has no history, no geography, just some physiology. The dislocation of life into a hyperreality or a hyperreality includes the Holocaust. Although seemingly realistic, the image of the Holocaust, as far as I understand it, is symbolic, alternating between history, what he called physiology, which he means actually literal embodiment, body, fiction, hyperrealism, and fantastic hyperbole. This experimental novel, interesting although not quite successful, projects an unusual rendering of the Holocaust positioned on the margin of mainstream Holocaust literature in Yugoslavia. The last author in my presentation is David Al-Bahari, born in 1948. Al-Bahari represents a transition from the period of post-war Yugoslavia to the post-Yugoslav period. He began publishing in the 70s. In 1994, already as an established Serbian and Yugoslav writer, Al-Bahari emigrated to Canada. Among his books of short stories and novels, there are the three that are most interesting for my discussion are Sink, uh, published in 88, Bait from 96, and Getz and Meyer from 98. Getz and Meyer are the names of two German officers who participated in a concrete way in the killing of Jewish women, children, and elderly in Belgrade during the Holocaust. The German occupying authorities interned the Jews in a camp called Seimischte, in the outskirts of Belgrade, and every day, one group after the other, they were transported from this camp to a burial place outside Belgrade in a special truck designed as a gas chamber. Getz and Meyer were the German officers who drove this truck and turned on the gas. The first sentence in al Bahari's novel reads, I quote, I never saw Getz and Meyer. I can only imagine them. And on the basis of documentary material, as the author himself mentions, this novel, with no paragraphs, chapters, or any <coughs> type of segmentation, proceeds as a fictional recreation of the subjective experience of the victims as well as the perpetrators. The narrator, who could to some extent be identified with the author, writes, I quote, I was over 50. I knew where life was taking me. So it was time to find out where it had started out. That is how Gates and Meyer came into my life." End of quote. This is, in a way, a return to a beginning, identified, in this case, with the collective Jewish experience, the Holocaust, which a writer born after the war, such as al-Bahari, could only imagine. The Holocaust as a collective history was a defining el element of identity in the post-war period. But so was, in al-Bahari's case, his family history, the history of his parents, who are referred to in the other two novels I have mentioned, Sink, which speaks about his father, and Beit, his mother, about his mother. Although in Al-Bahari's case, we should not identify the narrator with the author or the characters with his parents, 
both of these works use a lot of autobiographical as well as biographical elements. Al-Bakari, however, views both identity and literature in the context of postmodernist poetics and ideas. Reality is to a point objective, but beyond this point, it is a subjective experience, an interpretation, a fictional construct, and so reality, if we remember, is the sound and the fury signifying nothing. Well, the sound and the fury signifying nothing are articulated and then re-articulated, not in one, but in multiple narratives signifying something, but not always the same thing and not always one thing. Bait, one of his best novels, the one, one of the one, the one I like most, <laughs> uh, is a quest of identity in the midst of ambivalence. The story of the narrator's mother is told by herself, as interpreted by the listener, her son, as reinterpreted in intermittent dialogue between her son, who is presented as a novice writer, a beginner writer, an auto-ironic version of the author, and a Canadian fellow writer who stresses in a discreetly humorous manner how little he actually understands his Balkan interlocutor. And finally, we have the narrator's uneasy position of emigrant, not really at home in his new home. So there are three degrees of narration, intertwined and spiced with constant autopoetic references. The irony stressed by al-Bakhari is that the narrative striving to make sense is only that, a narrative that has taken the bait, the promise of absolute meaning, which dissolves in ambiguity. In al-Bakhari's work, and uh, I will finish with this, in his works, this is not only a question of personal identity, of his Jewish identity, or his emigrant's identity. It is a question of identity as such. Thank you. Mm -hmm.